Okay, last topic in the second chapter, and, and, and it's an awfully nice one. It's one that is traditionally given folks a lot of trouble, but uh, for, for mostly for, uh, for the approach, but uh, if you approach it the right way, it, uh, it is not just uh, neat, but it also has interesting things to say. Okay. Okay, so a diagnosis is clearly one of the key things that we do in this, in this subject, is that uh, it, it enables us to show that, for example, the halting problem is unsolvable. Okay, so uh, so you can see the title of the slide. What happens when diagonalization goes wrong? What 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 happens to 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 good good uh, good mathematics when diagonalization goes bad? So uh, so you recall the first example of diagonalization, the proof that the set of real numbers is uh, is not countable. So uh, of course you know you remember how it goes. Um, you, you assume that the, that there is an f. So you assume that f counts the real numbers somehow, and uh, you consider the inputs and outputs, and uh, you think about the diagonal, the 3, the 1, the 4, the 5, etc. Okay. So uh, if, the, if the decimal representation of the number on row n is uh, something before the decimal place, and we don't care because we ignore it, then uh, dn0, dn1, dn2, etc., when you go down the diagonal to the right of the decimal place, you get a sequence of digits D00, D11, D22, etc., like the 3, the 1, the 4, and the 5 that I've underlined. Using that sequence, you construct a number, I know you remember, you construct a number that uh, we, don't, again, don't care what happens before the decimal place, so we put a 0 there just to put something, uh, that has digits Z0, Z1, Z2, by making the, the nth decimal place be something other than DNN. And we had to worry ever so slightly about um, uh, uh, numbers that end in all nines and numbers that end in zero, but that was easily avoided. So we constructed a uh, we, we constructed the number z to have the property that uh, z zero is not equal to d zero zero, that z one is not equal to d one one, and etc. And of course, the the whole idea there was that uh, the diagonalization argument culminates in verifying that z is not any of the rows. Okay, so 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 again, you remember exactly how that goes. But what if, what if the diagonal is a row? What if when you do the transformation, you change the numbers on the diagonal? What if it is a row? Or what if z is uh, say row n zero here? What if z is row n n naught? Well. Then the, uh, the, the member of the array where the diagonal crosses the row, let's suppose, for example, we look here at n0 equals 2. The member of the diagonal where it crosses the row, in this case the 4, that number there has to be unchanged by the transformation. dn0,0 has to be t of dn0,0. So that is to say, if diagonalization fails, it has to be the case that your transformation has a fixed point. So diagonalization is a key technique. We've seen it work a number of times. What happens in cases where it fails? I mean, this, this, the trivial case is where the transformation is the identity function. You don't do anything to transformation. Well, the 4 equals the 4. Oh, oh, okay. Imagine a transformation that turned all the other numbers into 5s and left 4s as 4s. Okay, so the four is is uh, is a fixed point for the transformation. Okay, so so we get some information even when the transformation fa even when excuse me when the diagonalization fails. So we're going to apply this, of course, to computable functions because that's what we're doing. So we're going to apply this to sequences of computable functions. So we're interested in effectiveness. So we don't just consider arbitrary sets of indices down here, the i0, i1, i2. Instead, we're going to take indices to be computable. We want to, uh, we want to make it be the case that i0, i1, i2, etc. are computed somehow. That is to say, you write down a computer program and i0 is phi e of, of, of 0. And uh, I1 is phi E of 1 with the same E. You don't want to pick them arbitrary. They're, they're generated by a computer because that's the, the kind of thing we do in here. I2 is phi E of 2. So the sequence of computable functions has this form. That is to say that if I write down what do the sequences of computable functions look like, well, you take, uh, you take here the E equals 0. And you're looking at uh, phi sub phi 0 of 0 
phi sub phi 0 of 1, phi sub phi 0 of 2, etc. That's the equals 0 line, and the equals 1 line is, is well, you, you get the idea here. It's just a matter of me writing it down, phi sub phi 1 of 0, phi sub phi 1 of 1, phi sub phi 1 of 2, dot, 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 etc. So what we get is, in some sense, by taking different e's, we get every possible computable sequence of computable functions. They are computable sequence in the sense that we compute the indices by j j just by using the computable functions. Okay, and so I, I, you saw my handwriting, it's so embarrassing. So I wrote it out as a nice neat table here. E equals 0 equals 1 equals 2 equals 3. And there's phi 0 of 0, phi 0 of 1, phi 0 of 2, etc. Phi 1 of 0, phi 1 of 2, phi 1 of, excuse me, phi 1 of 1, phi 1 of 2, etc. Et et so you can see what I could do. I'm going to go down this diagonal, so let's do it. Every entry is a computable function. What happens if phi 3 of 0 diverges? Well, then the function as a whole diverges. That is to say, what if you go to compute this function on input 109? So your first step is to compute phi 3 of 0. What if phi 3 of 0 never halts? What's the, what's the value of this entire function on 109? The answer is it never halts. OK, so if phi e of n diverges, then the function as a whole diverges. Oh, OK, all right. So the natural transformation is to just transform here phi x to phi f of x for some computable function. So maybe, for example, you double the indices. So this, instead of becoming phi 2, would become phi 4, phi 4, phi 4, phi 4. The next result shows that under this transformation, diagonalization fails. And therefore, the transformation t sub f has a fixed point. OK, it's a lovely, lovely theorem. For any total computable function f, for any total computable function f, total means you remember that it halts on all, on all inputs. For any total computable function f, there's a k where phi k equals phi f of k. So just to go back to the prior slide, if I don't, if I don't lose my mouse totally, just to go back to the prior slide, if, for example, you take these indices down here and you double them, so, for instance, phi 2 goes to phi 4. Okay. Or if, for example, you, you triple them, or you square them, or you, uh, 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 you take, uh, you, you set them equal to 0 uh, uh, unless they are the number 5, unless they're multiple of 5, in which case you set them equal to 1. Okay, any of those functions I just mentioned, the doubler function, the, uh, the, the, the squaring function, that weird thing with fives, any of those functions has a fixed point in the sense given here that there will be, just take the doubler, there will be, up here, there will be some, some index k where phi k and phi 2k are the same. Let's take the squarer there will be some index k where phi k and phi k squared are the same. Isn't that weird? Isn't that We chose our numbering scheme in some seemingly arbitrary way, some just convenient thing about we had Cantor's diagonal function and we, we looked at four tuples and, and then binary expansion, some whatever was convenient at the moment, according to any acceptable numbering that you come up with. This fixed point theorem holds. That's a very, very unexpected thing. You should say to yourself, I, I don't see, that doesn't seem right to me. If I choose some cockamamie numbering scheme, it doesn't matter. As long as the numbering scheme is what we call acceptable, which is what you would expect of a numbering scheme, it doesn't matter, then this fixed point theorem holds. That's a powerful theorem. It works no matter what the numbering scheme is. Okay, so let's go through the steps. And of course, what's going to happen here is that we're simply going to go through the development that I had before with the big table, only it's going to be precise instead of hand wavy. Okay, so the array diagonal that I had earlier is up there. Phi sub phi 0 of 0, phi sub phi 1 of 1, phi sub phi 2 of 2, and we saw that before. The flow chart on the left is a sketch of this function. So let's see. You've got, uh, you, 
you read in n and x, you run pn on x, and once you know that pn on x is going to be the subscript, excuse me, pn on n is going to be the subscript, so that, for example, is going to be phi n of n. So that'll be the subscript. I'm calling that w just to give it a name. Using that w, now you run pw on whatever input you're interested in. Okay, so that gives you the entire table. This, this tells you here what is, what is phi sub phi n on n of x. Okay, well clearly you can write this as a program using universality. Well, since you can write it as a program, you can write it as a Turing machine. So this has some index. We're calling the index of this E0. Uh, you, you know what's going to happen because there are two flowcharts. I must be going to apply the SMN theorem. So I'm, get, I'm applying the SMN theorem to parameterize N. So this is going to be P sub, come on, P sub S of E naught comma N. That's right. You read X, but it, N is not part of the input. N is hard-coded into this. So this is actually a family of functions, infinitely many functions, parameterized by N. That's right. Okay, that's right. And uh, the description of what, what happens there is right here. The, the nth function in this family, um, if you give it an X, will output this result. The nth function in this family, if you give it an X, will output this result. And that's exactly what we talked about with the table, only written down in a sort of more precise and nice way. The index E is fixed because, of course, it was the index of the program on the left. So S of E, N, S of e naught N is a function of one variable. You uh, give that function a name just so that you don't have to write down so many symbols. G of N is S of E naught N, just to emphasize that the only thing that varies there is the N. So that the diagonal functions are just phi sub G of N. G is computable and total. S is, S is going to give you an output. S is never going to fail to halt. So S is computable. S of E naught comma N is com computable function of N and also total. All right, so now you look at what happens when you apply the transformation, T sub F. So you get, of course, you put F in front of all the subscripts. And remember what we talked about before. You might be, for example, doubling the subscripts, or you might be squaring the subscripts, or you might be uh, doing that weird thing with five that I don't remember anymore to the subscripts. Okay, so this is a composition F circle G, F circle G, F circle G. That composition is computable and total. It's total because F is total. We specified at, in the statement of the, of the fixed, point, that fixed point theorem that F is total. So F circle G is computable and total. You see it here. Do you see that it says run program f of w on x? Okay, so here it is. This says exactly what it does. Okay. Okay, now all we got to do is 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 uh, is quote the uh, quote the result about fixed points. So let's see. As the as the flowchart underlines, this is a computable sequence of computable functions parameterized by n. So it's a computable sequence, a family of infinitely many functions, computable sequence of computable functions. So it's one of the rows in the table because that table, let me go back to the table, that table consists of all possible sequences, uh, computable sequences of computable functions. So that, so, so that, there it is. So, so that, is a computable sequence of computable functions. So it's one of the rows. Oh, we'll call it row V, just to, just to give the row a, a name. And so that what we have is that phi sub F composed with G on M is equal to phi sub phi V of M. It is row V. Remember how the rows look. Phi sub phi zero of zero, phi sub phi zero of one, phi sub phi zero of two. That what stays the same along the rows is the subscript on the, on the lower phi. Okay, so just about done here.
Whoops, I went too far. Just about done here. So f, phi sub f of g, f composed of g of m, is phi sub phi v of m. I just gave a name to that row. And now where does the diagonal sequence phi sub g of n intersect that row? It intersects it, of course, at v. So because so uh, phi sub g of v has to be the same as phi sub phi v of v, because that's, that's the definition of the diagonal entry. And that's the same as phi sub f of g of v, because the, di the diagonal is a fixed point for the transformation t sub f. The diagonal entry is a fixed point for the transformation t sub f, so we get here the fixed point. Well, there we go. k equals g of v. You can just look at it. g of v, g of v, g of v. So k equals g of v is the desired fixed point. So again, any, oops, I, there we go. A, 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 any total computable function, no matter what crazy thing with uh, hundreds of if-then statements and loops and any total computable function has a fixed point. So no matter what crazy, computable, but what crazy way you transform the subscripts, it has to be the case that, and I mentioned doubling earlier, if, if for example, you double, if you double the subscripts, there has to be a, a, a k so that phi k and phi 2k are the same. Very strange. Okay, I, I'm just going to give one example, and of course the book gives many others and the homework gives others. So uh, I want to, uh, I, I want to, there's, there's an index e where, the, where phi e halts only on e. Uh, c c converges only on E. So program E, uh, up, if you say the Turing machine E halts only on E. Phi E converges only on E. Okay, so a little typo there. I'll change that in the slides. Okay? So you consider the flowchart on the left, and it's not very complicated. You read into inputs X and M. You say if X is equal to M, then you, you do some nominal, uh, you, uh, nominal printout, because I always like the programs to print out. And then if X is unequal to M, you go into an infinite loop. So this clearly only halts when X equals M. And you see what happens. Of course, you apply the SMN theorem to parameterize M. And the description there of what the of what the function is. This is phi sub s of e naught m because this of course is this of course has this program right here has index e Turing machine has index e. And this is a description of what happens. Oh, it's a zero. It's supposed to say forty two. My goodness, a lot of typos. I apologize. Forty two. E naught's fixed. So s of e naught x is a total computable function of one variable. Just emphasizing, I could write it as S of E naught M, but it's emphasizing here by writing it as F of M, emphasizing that there's only one variable in that expression, that E naught is not actually a variable. Okay? So the associated Turing machine holds only on M. So we have infinitely many here, infinitely many Turing machines. The first one holds only on zero, the second one holds only on one, the third one holds only on two, etc. And the subscripts, the, the numbers, the indices for those Turing machines are described by the function F. So, of course, the fixed point theorem, I'm, I, I, this is an application of the fixed point theorem. The fixed point theorem is a fixed point. Phi sub f of e is equal to phi sub e. Let's think about phi sub e. Well, we know what phi sub f of e does. Phi sub f of e is a Turing machine that halts only on e. So, well, that must be what phi e does because they're the same. So, phi e is a Turing machine that halts, phi e describes, the e describes a Turing machine that halts only on e. Now, I, I want to just briefly mentioned, the book goes into it at some length, and there's, uh, there's also an extra section that talks about it even more. Briefly, this is, you should, this should strike you as odd, because what happens in some sense is that this is a program that knows its own index. So you have a program that, that, whose behavior is such that it acts one way for its index, and it acts another way for, for numbers that are not its index. And that, again, it, uh, is, uh, it says that the programs, in some sense, know about themselves, a property called reflection, that you can have programs that somehow know about their own index. And of course, from the index, you can compute the source code. So you can have a program that knows about its own source code, in some sense. OK, so a lot of interesting ideas there. And again, the book goes into them at greater length. OK, very good.